It is time for season three of Tankis Piano with Helena Rothy's meandering conversations of mine, of mine. And I have just finished talking to Kate, Kate Inglis, who is a Canadian lovely woman whom I also have met on Twitter. We have been going deep, deep, deep into history. And history, for both of us, isn't just history, because history, according to like the proper terms, is recorded history. And then if it's not recorded, it's prehistoric. In my view, all of it is history. For as long as humankind of any kind have walked the earth. They are part of my lineage and they are part of my history, be it the recorded bit or not. But we also speak about discontent, about judgment and discernment. And I think probably the thing that we circle back to over and over again is anti-fragility. But there are some witches and dragons and magic and whatnot type travel here as well. So I hope you enjoy this first conversation with Kate. Good to see you. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah. I have just gone for a barefoot walk. It's, um, let's see, it's April 21st and it's 17 and a half degrees outside, ah, which is like, heavenly. Yeah. It, it hasn't be been this warm for a long time. Yeah. 17 would be a dream here. I mean, we're getting there. I, I feel like it might be getting up there today. I'm not sure, but it's definitely, that's, that's spring. It is almost summery treats. because, you know, there are Swedish summer days when it's not much warmer than this, uh, even though we can have warmer weather too. But it was so lovely. And then I got in, I warmed my tea kettle, and I turned on Ain't No Mountain High Enough by Pomplemousse. Uh, oh, loud volume. And just <laughs> dance. Three so you covered, three you covered like both ends of the energy spectrum. You connected with nature. You got really calm and peaceful. And then you blew the roof off. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. good. <laughs> yeah. So this is where I am. I'm like all over the place. You can, you can get me anywhere right now. Oh, uh, that's so good. Wonderful. Yeah. What about you, Kate? I am, I am in the middle of a little bit of a renovation space and quote with, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in chaos at the moment. So this is the only clean corner of my world at the moment. So we're just doing a small renovation, but it has a way of having a ripple effect through the whole house because up on the third floor here is where I get dressed. It's where I keep all my stuff. It's kind of my, my girl zone. So, um, and of course where I work. But now there's a there's a tile saw sitting there and there's sort of plaster dust everywhere. And so so I'm kind of in, in a bit of a chaotic space, but I slept well last night. So I feel good about that because the night before was one of those horrible churning awake until 4 a.m. and then up at 6.30 for the school bus kind of nights. And, oh, it really takes a chunk out of you. So I was like, I really want to sleep so good tonight so that I'm clear and I feel good. So. Good. It's sunny out today, so it feels like like you. It feels like spring today, so that's a, that's a great thing. It makes a yeah. difference. It does. So, how old is your house? Uh, not that old, actually. Not at all very old for this part of the world. It's right around turn of the century, so around 1901. So it's it's old, but every angle in the house is a right angle, like. None of the floors creak. Everything is super solid. The basement is not a murder scene waiting to happen. <laughs> so it's, you know, whereas some of the older homes here, like 1750, are, you know, they're charming, but they, they are a little more, uh, they require a different kind of uh, stewardship yeah. when you live yeah. in them. And so this, to me, feels quite decadent because other houses I've lived in have been 
older than this. And um, this was built by a sea captain and it was his forever home. So he, he, he didn't, he didn't uh, spare any, any, uh, any cost. Yeah, exactly. So it was, um, it, it's quite, quite a luxury because it just feels solid. It has such a good energy. So, yeah. So this is interesting because, because my house is from 1928. So it's yeah. younger than yours, but it also, it has that house feeling. You know, yeah. it's a house, it's a place, it's, it's not like a home. some, sh it's a home, it's not something shifty. There are homes where usually more modern buildings that don't really have the, the, the feeling that this, yes, that there's something here yeah. and this is, you know, it's an entity of its own. It's a creature all of its own. It has its, yeah. it's, its own identity in a sense, whereas there's like, there are some soulless places out there you can see. There are. Find. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we call, we, we use the word character when we're talking about spaces, when we're talking about buildings, homes. And when we use that word, we think of it as, oh, it, it has character, it has built-ins, or it has oak original molding that's never been painted, or it has, a, a, you know, that crooked floor, it's got character. And I think, no, a house having character is a house having and transmitting its own lineage to you and having a voice and having emotion. And, and I've had houses before that have been very broken and very troubled and very yes. sad and abandoned. And then I have that, that privilege of turning that character and giving that uh, like almost sort of a form of animal husbandry that, that you, you care for uh, a home and you impart character upon it so that you can then pass that character on to the next person. And it's not just about aesthetics. It's, it's something emotional. You know, I went from that house to a house that was utterly forgotten, you know, paint peeling off in like envelope sized flakes and broken windows and flooded basement. And it was a very sad house. And then I came to this house and this house was kind of staring down its nose and like yeah. her, you know, because she's <laughs> very, very grand. And, um, you know, that's, that's no comment on, on my, I mean, we live kind of in the middle of nowhere, uh, so it's not grand in the sense that I'm, I'm talking out myself or my, my um, capacity, but she is just, there's been some big people who have built this house and who lived in this house and who lived very large. And am I up to, am I up to it? You know, like it's, this house had to trust me. It had to kind of, okay, well, we'll see what you're made of kind of a thing, you know, and, so, yeah, I love that. I love thinking about, about the lineage of a bunch of wood and roof shingles and nails and, and what that, what that turns into. Mm. Yeah. In terms of story. I mean, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any, are there any books or films kind of where the protagonist is, is a house that. That's a good question. I mean, I think there's a lot of films where I think setting becomes a character that is equal to a protagonist. And sometimes it could be a city. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, I, I, it's, it's a silly reference because I never much liked the show, but I get it. I remember uh, hearing Sarah Jessica Parker talking about Sex and the City and saying New York was, was one of the characters. What is the, it? The fifth? Are there four of them? Uh, yeah, there's the four four, four women. Yeah, and then, and then she she basically said New York City is the fifth. You know, the fifth girl, <laughs> and and I can really see that it, when when something comes across so so strongly like that. So I think that's all over the place. I mean, every rendition of of Dracula, uh, the castle is an antagonist. You know, the, 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 the it, uh, setting can be the trap. It can be the refuge. It can be, yeah. So I think it, it certainly plays a, an incredibly strong and evocative role 
to be sure. Yeah, I was uh, I was watching the I think third season of Discovery of Witches. Uh, oh yeah, series on HBO based on the books by whatever her name is. I really yeah. enjoy. I'm I I like witches and vampires and stuff like that. But yeah, me too. And the, anything involving time travel. Yeah, precisely. I'm, I'm such right? a sucker. I'm such a sucker for that because I think yeah. about that a lot. Yeah. It's so fun. Yeah, and it is fun because of the stories that all of a sudden just open up. But but in in Discovery of Witches, the house in New York, upstate New York, wherever it is, Massachusetts, maybe it is. I don't I remember. I can't remember. Where, somewhere in New England, yeah. Somewhere in New England, where yeah. the house is definitely one of the one of the That's true. Like, key players in the uh, yeah. not not a prominent role, but when she's on stage, she sure is on stage. Yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. But but it was interesting because I did I haven't like you're in Canada, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is when I will profess to my kind of ignorance where it is so easy to just kind of think North America is the U.S. and, you know, and then there's a little bit of Canada on top. Yeah. And it's like, there's a shitload of Canada, Canada. on top because that's the most. I know. I think volume-wise it is way bigger. But, but I have always thought, because we were, when my dad, um, he worked for a year in Washington, D.C., in 86. Wow. Oh, so me and my brother were there for three weeks in the summer visiting him. And we went to William, Williamsburg, Virginia, which is this like museum town-ish. It's a, I think, a big setting for the Civil War. Precisely. I should know that. But yes, yeah. okay. Yeah. It's one of those Something places. Something like that. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, and it was like, oh, it's so old. And and it was like built, or the, at least the, the sort of the what I perceived it to be, all of the houses there were like m maybe the 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 age of your house. It's like yeah, yeah around not... the turn of the century, nineteen hundreds. And I'm like, right. But I come from Malmo, and the house I lived in was built in eighteen ninety six. It's like I'm not gonna go here and gush over these old buildings. Like I live no. in an older building. So no. so I have I have kind of put this view of. All of North America, there's no old buildings. And I know well, it's, it's not true. Yeah. I know that there's, you know, I know that there's older houses from the 1800s in, in New York, on Manhattan, in Boston. You can sure. have, but, but, yeah. but there's something. So it was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's all relative. I, I remember it never left my mind. Someone said something once that in Europe, a hundred miles is a long way. And in North America, a hundred years is a long time. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was really wonderful because in England, you can go to a 400 year old pub that has yeah. been there operating as a pub for 400 years. You can mm -hmm. go to, I mean, I think that's the case throughout Europe, um, <laughs> that obviously the whole, the old, old is, is proper old, <laughs> whereas we are kind of colonial old, like, yeah. like we, we kind of right around like this, where I live exactly. Some people say Riverport was the first Canadian settlement like ever. So that's going back to sort of around, I think, 1730, 1740, maybe 1750. I think actually, I just walked by a little monument the other day. So that's just about as early as it gets in terms of settlers arriving and beginning to leave their mark and, and build things. Um, but of course, 1750, I mean, that's, <laughs> it's, it's funny. I mean, where the motherland, all the motherlands, 1750 is, is sort of middling old. So yeah. it's, uh, it, it's funny to think about. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it but I mean, that's, that's also part of what, what I, I like old, mm. like in, in general, I'm, you know, I like old. Yeah. Uh, 
in many ways, but there's also this Holden, holden blindness that comes over me or us, right? It's like, I don't, I don't see the oldness here until I reflect on, oh yeah, you come from there where you are at. It's not as old. It's really, really old where you are. And then what is like the comparison. So, so the yeah contrasting European old to, to North American old. It's like, well, it's so different. Yes. They're just so different. Yeah. Because you might think that that just makes Europe fantastic, that it's so much older, but then the North American side and really Australia, uh, all the other countries that were kind of settled later, um, those countries have a really fantastic story as well and fantastic i'm using that in the, in the in the most base kind of form fantastic terrible fantastic amazing fantastic impressive fantastic tragic um and so the story i mean that's why we are so entranced with cowboys and open spaces and covered wagons i just watched 1863 i keep forgetting which here it is, but it's a series about basically the, um, the trail of, of covered wagons going West. And it's, it's, uh, it's an incredibly romantic piece of history that it's, I mean, it's the history is just so evocative, no matter where we look, whether we are sitting in that 400 year old pub in, in Bath, or if we're in the middle of a, of, of a Texan plane and thinking about the hardship that people endured. And really, I think that's, that's one of the most important lessons of history is to think about with, with gratitude and absolutely stupefied perspective, just how much hardship people went through for the most basic things that we don't even have to think about now. Uh, like childbirth or like shelter, you know, just being out of the elements, um, uh, unexpected weather, uh, crops going bad. We have kind of fail safes for everything in our life right now. And we have a social safety net. We have uh, connection and communication. We, you know, people used to go from, from, England, like my people came from Germany and Scotland and, and, and a little bit from France. And so they came over and they never saw their family again. Never, their family never knew what happened to them. And even just the gravity of that goodbye as being a real proper goodbye, we, we never really say goodbye and we don't have to in, in our society because we've got FaceTime and, and the speed of our communication isn't just quick, it's instantaneous. and it drives me crazy when people look at history with either disinterest or with their own modern narrative kind of layered on top, uh, or in a way that sort of almost infantilizes history and infantilizes all the people who came before us and who made us and who constructed this world because we sort of think that we know, we, we are so arrogant and we think that in the modern world that we know how things should be done. And all those people, they didn't know how things should be done. And we have no idea the level of genius and the backbreaking, absolutely literally backbreaking work that had to be done to build a forest in Nova Scotia, sorry, to build a road through the forest in Nova Scotia when there wasn't a road there before. Like, what that took, it, it's, it's so staggering to me. And, and I think that's a part of that romance again, and I'm using romance, like the word fantastic, um, just that, that human grit of the past. And, and I feel like we don't do enough reflection on it humbly with our mouths shut. <laughs> we, we don't really think about it enough and we also, I think, should go forward in our lives thinking, what do I owe everyone who came before me 
in terms of how I comport myself with dignity, with integrity. What's my work ethic compared to the people who came before me? How can I do things maybe better in terms of not passing on abuse? Or I mean, we all have that stuff going on in our family. But just the resilience, I, I, it's an overused word, but the grit of the people who came before us, we owe it to take it on as a personal challenge and pass it on to our kids. And I think that is one of the most important uh, things that history is constantly reaching out and offering us and not everyone takes it. And, and, and because it's very powerful to feel like you're sort of, you know, hard done by. It's very, very seductive. And, and it, it spits in the face of everyone who came before us. So it's, uh, there's my little rant. I don't even know where that yeah. came from. <laughs> and, and, and it's so interesting because when I hear you say um, history, what I also think is what you also say, everybody who came before me. But yeah. history actually isn't everybody who came before me. History is everybody who came before us since we have records of it. Mm, right? Yeah. Otherwise, it's prehistoric. Yes, that's right. And they came before us too. I know. In my mind, it's everybody. Everybody is history. And then there's recorded history or what, you know, evidence of history in more than bones, like, you know, books or scrolls or yeah. cave paintings or whatever it be, that there's, that is, that is recorded history. That is where we have something more tangible to go on than, than what's before that. But that which is before that is not irrelevant. It is not worthless. It is not useless. It holds merit and it holds value. It holds knowledge. Is it easy to come by? Heck no. <laughs> Because yeah. it's not recorded, right? But but that's 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 one of the things that can really get me riled up. How also in our arrogance, in the modern man, in our arrogance, perceive what we say is history to be the history of mankind. Like humanity kind of started, you know, sometime back ten thousand years ago or something. No, we didn't. You know, yeah. it goes on forever before that. Yeah. Um, and then it's so easy to, to kind of, to just look at those, uh, you know, it's like, okay, I can look back a hundred years or 200 years or 300 years, maybe a thousand, right? But before that, there's nothing. It's like, yes, there is. And 10,000 yeah. years ago, there's a lot too. 50,000 years ago, yes, there's a lot too. 100,000 years ago, yes, there is a lot too. But we've kind of distanced ourselves from it. Losing sight of the long arc, the really long arc. Mm -hmm. The animalistic arc. Yeah. I mean, where, where I think that that is all we can do in that sense is to tap into that vibration of those people. And that's kind of the ohm. That's really all we can do to try to hear them and speak to them because they're a long way back. But that's, you're right. That's absolutely a part of our lineage too. And, and, and I think, you know, when we use the word history, a lot of us are also thinking, you know, the battle of the plains of Abraham <laughs> or, you know, the big events, the fantastic things, the romantic things um, that we read about in textbooks. Um, but to me, the history is just as fascinating uh, on an individual level in terms of all of the tiny stories that, that were unremarkable to everyone else except to the person living, to the woman, the daughter, the, the wife, the mother, waiting on the seashore for that fishing mm -hmm. boat to come back, and it doesn't come back. And that happened over and over and over and over again in my family because we were all fishing oh. and we were master mariners as well. So, um, 
there are so many people in my genealogy who were lost at sea, lost at sea, you know, thrown mm -hmm. from a top mast, uh, swept overboard. Uh, one of them was uh, a 14 year old boy was tied to the, his father. The last thing his father did was tie him to the mast of their schooner right before the father was swept overboard. The whole crew was swept overboard and the boy was found four days later, still tied to the mast because he couldn't, he couldn't get, get out. out and he survived and he went on to have 13 children and he, he went on to become a master mariner as well himself and traveled the world in his own schooner and became a captain for himself. But you think again, like I'm having a hard day because I've, you know, I missed a credit card payment. And then I'm thinking yeah. about that kid. Come again. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> I'm thinking about that kid who had the same last name as my grandmother, Sponagal, which was that that was kind of our well a lot of our family was german but that was uh part of the german immigrants who came here uh to basically make Lüneburg county what it is and it's a very famous place architecturally because it became such a unique pocket of german culture which it still is today with lots of schnitzel and sauerkraut and extremely hardy people um so yeah, I, I just, I find those stories. I think that's why I'm drawn to, it's like sushi. Even if it's bad, I love it. And it's the same thing with any stories that have time traveling. <laughs> like, just give it to me, yeah. give it to me yeah. right now. Because I just, I, 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 I love history so much in that unremarkable way. I wish that I could taste that butter because I know that it would taste better than anything that we have today because it was mm. closer to source everything back then was closer to source from butter to pain everything was was stripped back to its raw elements and and i envy that at the same time that's a really um juvenile kind of envy because my god they would look at us they would look at me and say you like my butter but you like i like i would have died twice having my two sons had I had it back in those days. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a fancy of privilege to be able to daydream like that, you know, about what butter must have tasted like, but I think it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's sort of a container for grieving all that we've lost in the modern world, uh, as juvenile as it might come across because we have lost so much. Um, our food system is so screwed up and so full of chemicals and artificial things and fillers and hormones and, and, and we're excreting all kinds of drugs into our water supply. And, and, and it's, it's, it's just sort of a, I think having that romantic view of the past is just wishing that we could turn back that clock to just be, you know, I, I think a lot of us have this inarticulable draw to uh to something we're not sure what it is but we all feel a bit lost with i mean my god we all i mean you and i both remember before there was internet that's another big one but we sort of um and i think what that urge is is that and no one ever really talks about this but i think we want more wholesome lives we want more wholesome days more wholesome uh parenting more wholesome schools we want more wholesome food because we want stuff that is just pure and we want to strip it back to its basis level uh you know if only we could blend that purity of the past in terms of those raw ingredients with the compassion and innovation in in terms of uh, you know around around the the managing the pain of human life if we could only blend those two things together, I think we would actually be okay. But we're very, we've lost wholesomeness. And, and uh, that's something I grieve for all the time, whether it's those big things like food systems or small things, like we don't know how to dance anymore. And, and that's recent, you know, that's very recent. My mom knew how to jive or... I, Lindy, you know, <laughs> really good yeah. for you. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I just I just feel like there's something there's a proper kind of elegance and a dignity to our parents' childhoods and our grandparents' lives that that went away so fast in such a short amount of time that when I think about it, it kind of makes my head spin a little bit. Um, yeah. So again, do you think, another rant. <laughs> do you think uh, this is me and Caspian and Dominic, we, we had a podcast called Buddhas by the Roadside and, and there were plenty of rants. And then in one of the episodes, I don't know who said it. It was like in 10 rants later and Dominic or Caspian just went, oh, that's a perfect podcast name. We should have named it 10 rants later. That's a good this one. This one is turning into 10 rants later. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> we'll see if we can make it to 10. Let's <laughs> see. We have two. Um, but I was, I was thinking about wholesomeness. Do you think it is lost or is it simply for, I mean, is it lost as in gone, poof, or is it simply forgotten or neglected or, you know, out of date, but it is there so that we can access it yeah. again? I think it's a bit like history always standing there. History meaning our direct history. History is always right in front of us going, here, this is some perspective for you. Here is your anti-fragility. You can take it any time and you'll be better for it. But a lot of us don't see it. And I think wholesomeness is much the same. Um, so it's always there. It's always kind of, you know, it, it's always present in our lives. It's always waiting for us to just take it. But the way the modern world is constructed now makes it harder and harder work to access and create that for ourselves. We can do it anytime. We can clean the way that we eat. We can clean the way that we parent. We can uh, clean however you interpret wholesomeness, whether it's getting toxins out of your environment or learning how to lindy hop. Um, it's right there. We can stop, you know, doom scrolling on TikTok and start learning how to dance anytime we like. Uh, we can get outside more. You can always go for a walk. There are no barriers. We have the least number of barriers that any humans ever have in human history to everything, whether it's insight, education, medical assistance, companionship, uh, fresh air, sunshine. Um, so is know. it the comfort that keeps us from it? Is it we leave, it's just too mm. comfy. It's too comfy to be stuck on the sofa doom scrolling TikTok. Oh, I can't be bothered to go out. Mm. Oh, it's raining. I will, you know, it's like I'd rather just curl up here with a Netflix show and a cup of tea. Well, Is now it... let's leave room for the Netflix shows and the cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> that's where we get our time travel trash. So it is. don't, it don't, is. yeah, there's, there is a time in every, uh, what is that, uh, time in every day for that for song. For a Netflix show? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, tell me your question again. I just lost my train of thought. Is, if it is comfort that, yes. that right. keeps us from doing that, because there was, I was, um. I was listening a couple of months ago to a Swedish pod um, where they say just this part of what is now making us so sick is that we are not ever exposed to hardships or extremes. And I don't yeah. mean mental. I mean, you know, cold. Mm. I mean, get your heart pumping because you're racing up the hill or... Like yeah. I did yesterday, I was biking like crazy to reach the bus and I got there. But man, was I sweating. I was thinking, yes, this is brilliant. This is why I'm always late. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not always late anymore, but I still do. Yeah. You know, it's like we, we, there's, I have, you know, I have a fridge, a freezer and a pantry full of food. Yeah. 
right? Where's the hunger? Where's the cold? Where's the strenuousness? Where's the, those types of, of like coming towards the edges, not falling off the edge. I don't have to starve to death. I don't have to freeze to death, right? That's not what I'm speaking of, but experiencing cold, experiencing, okay, maybe I don't need to have five meals a day. Um, because, well, again, comfort, it's so handy. It's just there. Yeah. It's trained dance because everything now is so easy that the word hardship came to me too. We are averse to it because we have been sort of, we are the slowly boiling frogs in terms of wanting things to be convenient and growth is inconvenient. Pain is inconvenient. Of course, one leads to the other. And we, we are like gerbils always wanting that validation, always kind of pushing that, that button for the Coke, for the cocaine of, 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 of validation. And, and it's something that really, I have such an allergy to this particular part of what seems to me to, I'm sorry to have to put it this way, but seems to me to be a uniquely female part of the culture where we are obsessed with the kind of, uh, the self-help validative, um, sort of, you know, stand in your own truth and lived experience. And it's this whole thing of like, oh, you're this precious, precious creature and you are enough. And that has always rubbed me the wrong way because I never want to feel like I am enough. Oh, no, this is I'm so never interesting. enough. Like, no, no, I'm always discontented because if I wasn't always discontented in some amount, in some degree, where does my creativity take root? What pushes me to the next uh, ridiculous thing that I'm trying to write? What pushes me to try and write that novel? Nothing. Because I'm just comfortable, comfortable, comfortable. And I just feel so good about myself all the time. I don't need to feel good about myself all the time. For heaven's sakes, I'm not, I don't want to ever be that fragile. I don't want people to have to, you know, uh, center me or listen to my voice or hear my stories. No, I'm not special. None of us are special. And, and I really feel this kind of, oh, it's this like Instagram thing with all the hashtags of like, you know, oh, you're so, it's this preciousness that I just want to like take a wet fish and just smack smack <laughs> stop it just there's there's a really funny um I don't remember if it's SNL or Mad TV oh Bob Newhart I think is his name mm -hmm. uh really funny skit that if you see if anyone has seen it they'll know it but you if you google Bob Newhart stop it it's the funniest thing in the world. And it's exactly how I feel. I am Bob Newhart, like, and which is fascinating because I wrote a book on grief. You know, I had an infant son who died six weeks old. He was the twin of my youngest son, who's now 15, just about. And it was a complete catastrophe. And it was the saddest thing that I had ever experienced um, in my life. And it, took me a long time to get over it, but it was also the biggest thing and the most illuminating thing, of course, obviously that I ever, of course, those, those things are great pain. You know, the Spider-Man great pain brings great responsibility, right? Great illumination. And, um, so I, I ended up writing a book on, on, on grief in general as kind of springboarded from infant loss and from holding a dead child. And, uh, but he, uh, that was, you know, I, that writing is 15 to 10 years old now. And I look at it now, it's, it's a little tiny bit cringy to look at this book, which is just right around. I, sh I, I feel like I should hold it up now and go, hold it up. Don't so believe I can everything see. you're hold, hold it up on. so I can see. Not, not <laughs> as a self-promoting kind of a thing, but just to say, you know, this is the aggravating thing about being a writer is that you, you write this book called Notes oh. for the Everlast, which is, uh, I love the cover. It's a very yeah, pretty it's cover. Gorgeous. It's a bird. Um, 
It's, I'll put a link a in the show notes. Yes, it's a crow. Yeah. Um, but it's hard because as soon as you finish a book and it goes out into the world, it's kind of frozen. And the act of releasing a, a, a work like this freezes me as well. So whoever picks up this book is getting the me of five to 10 to 15 years ago. And I've changed Jeez. so much to the point where I wish I could rewrite it. Like, because I'm now Bob Newhart saying, stop it. Like, stop it. <laughs> and also the context. I love that. Well, not entirely. That sounds kind of cruel. But there's a little bit of that in here, I think. But um, part of the problem is that our world has changed so much around me. I have not changed. I mean, I have in, in respect to grief. But the world has changed so much that now there are things in the book in this context that mean something different than I meant them to mean. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the context of, you know, uh, this whole sort of validation cult that so many women are now sort of fawning themselves, like just dripping into like by the thousands and using all the hashtags and standing in their truth and all this. Can I swear? You can. I swear all, all the fucking shit. time. So go yeah, ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, so I feel like I, I wish I could write it again. And with all of the love, the deep, deep love and messy affection for every woman that has held a dead child, because we like, we know, like, I know you nothing else about you matters. I know you, it doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter what your religion is, what your worldview is. It doesn't matter if you live in a trailer in Kentucky or a castle in France. If we've both held that child, I know you and you know me, and we are sort of little fists in the air together in the world and still kind of bumbling through life, having carried this and still having to carry it. Um, <clears throat> but I would rewrite it now with all of that affection and all of that understanding and compassion. Plus, do not fall into the hashtag trap. Stop reading all those affirmative, you know, affirmative kind of validating books. Put them all down. Go out and do something. Like, just stop thinking of yourself as this fragile victimized traumatized my trauma as soon as we call something ours we are wearing it like a sandwich board like yeah. it is my pain and it makes me even more special than i was before yeah. and everyone has pain so everyone is walking around with these sandwich boards of all these identities constructed in grievance constructed in pain and trauma and it all just becomes this heavier and heavier and heavier. And I just think, just stop it. Stop. Because you're cultivating your own weakness. You're cultivating dead end after dead end after dead end. And you're making me less interested in, in, in you know, because you're kind of slapping yourself with all of these labels. And you're making yourself fragile. And I think that is where kind of our thread through this conversation of history kind of comes in. The way that we honor the people who made us most vividly, whether they are grandparents that we can actually remember or great, 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 great grandparents whose names many people don't remember because they don't have a dad like I do who, who's kind of a genealogy geek. Uh, but you owe it to all of those people distantly all the way back to not be fragile. Because everything they did, everything they sacrificed and suffered in their life was specifically so that you would be strong and so that you would uh, sort of get through whatever life was going to throw at you. And so you owe it to all of those ghosts who are cheering you on to not be sitting in a stew of your own poison, your own, you know, that, that tastes like candy. Like you are your own witch. And you are your own, you know, the, what's that story? Is it Hansel and Gretel with the, 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 the candies, like the, the candy house? You have constructed your own gingerbread house of affirmation and validation, but it's poison candy because it's making you weak and fragile. And, and that sounds like really kind of cruel, but life is cruel. And 
the faster that we can start kind of dusting ourselves off and saying, I have this pain, I'm carrying this weight. You might actually have trauma going beyond hashtags. Um, but we owe it to everyone else and to ourselves to practice anti-fragility, to say, I'm going to carry this with dignity. I am going to carry this with integrity. I'm going to make sure that I am mothering myself or fathering myself uh, in a way that also includes a little bit of a slap with a wet fish now and then. Now, come on, smarten up, <laughs> you know? So, so rant number three. Rant number three. We're <laughs> checking them off for sure. Yeah. So, so much here. First of all, I... This is another perspective on, on the aspect of am I enough that, that I really, really enjoy. I had a, my Tankespian community, the Patreon, uh, we do a monthly meetups and we had one recently on <clears throat> am I enough, which yeah. was so interesting. Yeah. Um, but You have identified the strata, the substrate that makes you get uh, nourishment, strength, energy from like fodder as discontent. Right. That's that it. little, right? the pebble yeah. in your shoe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, precisely. It's like. I can see that and I don't believe that that is a truth, capital T. Mm -hmm. It's your truth. It's not the yeah, truth. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. Somebody yeah. else might have a totally different strata that nourishes them that is based in, I don't know, Lindy hopping, you know, is like whatever else it can be it can be curiosity i'm so freaking curious maybe you can kind of twist that into being a discontent because i don't know it you know it's like but i think that there's different ways of framing that of phrasing yeah. that of of naming that and the really interesting part is figuring that thing out for yourself. Absolutely. Do I yeah. know what, what nourishes me? What type of soil do I need for me to become the yeah. plant that I am? You know, am yeah. I a cacti, really barren, no water, you know, except once a year and then I'll bloom in no time. Right? Yeah. Or am I a, a, a reed standing in, 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 on the edges of the shore in water yeah. all the time? Right? Yeah. Totally different. Yeah. I love that analogy. But finding your, finding out what's the composition that my nutritious substrate needs to have for yeah. me too be anti-fragile for me to be to to take on like you say actually take on kind of the challenges of of the ghosts of of my past with you know inherited uh behaviors and beliefs etc it's like okay now the buck stops here that's work yeah that's work Absolutely. to do that to shed work. yeah to shed yeah. those circles or to break those circles and to build a new one that I can pass on to my kids or to those around me. Yeah. Uh, what's the nourishment that I need for that? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on how we define discontent. So I don't see it as a negative word at all. Um, I see it as drive. I see it as an itch that, that needs to be scratched in a way that's really beneficial for us. And it's a challenge. It's, it, you always want to be, to hear challenges that are being issued to you. You don't want to be so wrapped in bubble wrap that you can't hear clearly. 
when something isn't quite right. You don't want to be insulating yourself so much with, I am okay, I am enough, that you end up kind of cocooning and not ever being, finding that state and entering, stepping into that state of discomfort. Because if you're never uncomfortable, then you're not trying to do anything. You're not trying to shift your life. You're not trying to change the narrative of all the people who came before you, perhaps. You're not creating anything. You're not building anything. Uh, and you're not acting. You're, you're sort of existing instead of uh, having autonomy. You know, I think that's what what it is for me is that I want to be accountable for shortfalls, for lapses. I want to hear those calls and, and, and I don't want to always be insulating myself. And, and I think too many of us are so busy telling us that we're okay and that we're, we don't need to do anything else in life because we imagine that our lives are really difficult, but that's a crutch to keep us from having to do hard work because again, we're looping back around to life being so easy for so long that we are averse to hard work and we are especially averse to hard emotional work and hard mental work. Um, we don't want to really look in a clear mirror at ourselves. We don't want to, you know, it's so much easier to just blame your parents or blame society or, you know, and, and we're so busy. We spend so much time rationalizing that narrative that kind of excuses us from the hard work that that's all we ever end up doing. We make work out of rationalizing our way out of work, you know? So, so I think when I say discontent, that's kind of my shorthand for, um, that, that fits me. Absolutely. Not that it's this really harsh kind of that you should be upset all the time. It's not that at all. It's just, um, yeah, it's the, you know, if you never fall when you're skiing, then you're not learning. Then you've plateaued. You're comfortable and you might feel like you are, your dignity is intact as you're making your way down the mountain. But you know, somewhere deep inside you, you know that you're not really trying. You're not, you've kind of plateaued at this level and you're looking at that more difficult terrain over there. And you're like, I might look like an idiot if I go over there. I might fall. Yeah, yeah you might. I won't. Yeah, yeah it's, it'll be uncomfortable. It'll hurt. Uh, it might challenge your muscles. You might be sore tomorrow if you go over there uh, into that ungroomed snow. But if you don't, then you're just going to stay here over here on the easy groom stuff, thinking that you look better than you would if you went over there, you know, it's, and so to me, that is kind of, uh, that is what I seek. And I think that is, that is also a word that came to me too. It's just a matter of being a seeker. And I think seekers are always discontented a little bit because there's always, and, and like curiosity is another great word for that. They're, they're always, uh, not settling in sort of eventually like concrete into uh, comfort and into simple sort of uh, no nuance kind of narratives that are just and excuses and crutches. And, and I think seekers are curious endlessly and well, I could have made that better. And well, how would I rewrite that book and why, and how have I changed and what's my context and to always kind of have a little bit of that churn and that curiosity that sometimes keeps you up until four in the morning. <laughs> and um, that just feels important. That feels really important. And I think it manifests differently for different people. Absolutely. I did, um, I did my first glass bead games online. Glass? What is that? Glass bead games uh, on, on Tuesday, it's Thursday today. Glass bead games is a novel by, um, Herman Hesse. I think his name okay. is in English. Herman Hesse. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where he, he, I haven't read the book. Um, he explains this, this game without actually explaining the game. He doesn't like give any details to how. So there's people 
that I don't know of who have like, okay, what to get to what he's pointing to, how could you set this up? And then they've been playing yeah. with this and, and finding a way. And so um, I think my fifth conversation with Steve, we went into the difference between judgment and discernment which just mm. totally blew my mind because he started to speak about comparison versus contrast. And and when uh, I put those two words on top of judgment and those two words on top of discernment, whoop, something completely different oh, happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I the, the episode description for that uh, episode was on this, which my friend Michael Sillian, also known as Captain Future, uh, read, picked up on and said, oh man, this would be perfect for a glass bead game. And I was like, okay, he's been trying to get me on one of those forever and ever. They do them okay. at least every week. Yeah. Um, and so we had one on Tuesday and... Let's say that there were eight of us, a little short intro. I riffed a little bit about judgment and discernment, but without narrowing the field. Yeah. Um, and then we broke out into breakout rooms and had, you know, basically we did five rounds of 50 minute, 50 second talk. So now it's your turn. You have 50 seconds. Do you want to talk? Do you want to be silent? Where are you going? You kind of just go around the table like this over and over and over again, five times. And then you come back into the, to the main room and we were all discussing what we saw. And one of the things that I saw, and this is where I, I related back to what you were speaking about, this, this sense of concrete, this rigidity yes, that for me is judgment yeah. that is the feeling of judgment it is right or wrong it is yeah it it has a heavy vibe to it and it to a large extent has an external vibe to it it comes from the morals the ethics the this that and the other yeah. thing but it's it's like you know we have rules or laws or regulations and stuff that you can kind of measure up against this and you judge and I can judge myself too but it's usually comparing myself to what you're supposed to be or this is how you should be etc whereas discernment and and it was beautiful I really really enjoyed it and at the end the very end because in the in the in the group that I was in, I went fourth. So the last of the five sessions, I was the last. And when I came there, the sensation of discernment. We were talking about discernment being more like dancing, being more like this. There's a flow yeah. in it mm -hmm. that kind of discernment it can lead to judgment but na judgment is much narrower discernment is more a flow it is more this does this work right yeah. now or not it's not this is right or this is wrong but discernment is a little bit like a butterfly because i fly around i land on a flower that i in the moment perceive to be this is the one right now this is the right one I try some nectar and then I, you know, flit off and ever so lightly, I touch down on another flower, taking some of that nectar and then I flit on again. Mm -hmm. I, and it was just such a, a liberating feeling to, to kind of get that image of it, which is so contrasting to the judgment, the rigidity, the et cetera. And for me, the rigidity is fragility. Oh, absolutely. Right? A hundred percent. The other yeah. thing, that's where the anti-fragility is because, yeah, I have my favorite blossom over there, but I can also, you know, yeah. it, it, it is a much more freer um, in movement 
yeah. way of of being in the world. And that's a little bit what I hear you say, but in completely different words, perhaps. That there's yeah. this, oh, there's a flower over there. Let me go see. What can I, you know, what can I get from this flower? What's here? Um, rather than, no, I only want red flowers or no, I only do clovers or whatever. It's like, sorry, dude, you're, you're, you're a goner. You know, life is going to be really hard for you if that's how you yeah step into the world if that's how you show up in the world i think that's i mean that is such a wonderful analogy for emotional and intellectual freedom so that is the contrast of tribalism and nuance and people who seek nuance and people who uh you know the butterfly going from flower to flower is open discourse and people who are engaging in open discourse in good faith because they are genuinely curious and they are unburdened by concrete narratives and versus the people who are so insistent that they are sitting in the, in the perfect spot, that they are unassailable. And, and like a fortress, they are unassailable and they are also sitting in the perfect spot, you know, looking between the, 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 the slit of the, the citadel the bill, from which yeah. they can, they can then assail everyone else. They can go and say, look at all those evil butterflies, you know, flitting around from all those flowers they shouldn't be sipping from. And, and that, that makes me sad, but, you know, and then, and that's getting out to a little bit of that's broadening the analogy a bit, I know, but. But that is a big part of, of the context that we're in that as an artist uh, that I find tragic. Yeah. And I see it. I see it in friends. I see it in my community. I see it in my culture. I see it in media. I see it I, I, all over the place. It's just concrete, 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 concrete everywhere. And that, that we are discouraged from being butterflies. You know, that there is a suspicion of, of, of butterflies. So how do you butterfly? Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good question and a really tricky question to answer because the moment we're in, uh, you know, put it this way, I butterfly very carefully. I try to butterfly out of view of the slits in the fortress. I try to find the So that spots. no one can shoot that arrow at you? Maybe. I guess so. I mean, I'm an author in Canada hoping to get book deals. So I have to. I have to be uh careful um because it's not fashionable in canada to be a butterfly i don't know how things are in sweden but uh in canada it's very much uh you know you 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 are either in the fortress or you're outside of it you are either with us or you are against us and uh that might partly be sort of the demographic that i'm in uh, it could be by chance, uh, who knows, but, um, carefully, thoughtfully, and always looking for humor. And I think as a general rule, um, when people use the word should, a little bell goes off in my head. Uh, you know, you should or shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't say that you shouldn't think that, or you shouldn't listen to that person because, ooh, um, so discernment has a lot to do with effectively butterflying uh, for oneself to kind of evolve. I want wide open horizons. I want to be able to go where I want. And as soon as I'm told where I have to go, what I have to think, what I have to find funny or not funny, what I'm supposed to be offended by or not offended by, I can't help it. I just, again, I'm allergic to it. I, I but. 
so so I think at this moment, um, there's some cowardice in in how I move as a butterfly because I am constrained by my dreams and by the context of, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not famous. I'm not successful to the point where I can write my own checks. And there's a lot of us out there that are like that. There are people who are very kind of heterodox thinkers who speak for the majority of the rest of us because they can weather those arrows. Um, but the, the, the little, the little guys are, are much less able to. So, so I try to, um, I try to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm listening to a range. I'm trying to make sure that I'm laughing That's a good and one. that I'm able to laugh, not only at other people, obviously it's not so much like that, but able to laugh at myself, able to step outside myself and see myself, uh, to, to always be checking for my own concrete. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't want to ever be rigid like that. And the current moment demands rigidity. It demands that you chant along and say the things, say the current thing. And you have to say it with me, with, with, with gusto, uh, and, and I just, no, I just, I can't say or do what everyone else is saying or doing. I just, it immediately, I, I it, it turns me right off. I, I can't, because it makes me suspect. It makes me see mob patterns. It makes me see a uh, coher sort of uh, cohesion that is natural only in certain formations. I see kind of mass contagions. I see, um, I see people adhering and I, I don't want to adhere. So I just kind of squirrel away and, and, and I think I'm just waiting for a bit of a saner, I'm, I'm waiting for sanity to emerge. And I think it is in some ways, but I cannot afford to personally, uh, help that along because I'm not big enough. So. I'm not, and maybe just not brave enough. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, yeah. So, so in, it, it's very difficult to be an artist now. Uh, I think because we are told that our immutable characteristics are the most notable things about us. And to me, they're the least notable things about us. To me, it's more interesting what you have suffered and what you have created and what you have built and the choices you make in your life. Um, your agency is much more interesting to me than anything else about you that you can't change. So, uh, it puts me in a bit of distemper all the time <laughs> because right now in the world, we're just, we're fixated on the most boring pieces of, of, of the most boring markers of human, uh, type. And uh, again, like referencing earlier part of our conversation, what I find more interesting is those experiences that cross all the types, because that is where we bond. If you've held a dead baby and I've held a dead baby, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how much money I have compared to you. It doesn't matter how I worship or if I don't. Uh, it doesn't matter what country I'm in or what language I speak. I am you and you are me. Um, you know, hunger doesn't care what we look like. It feels the same. And, uh, you know, people who've experienced poverty um, are going to have the same hunger. And so I think as an artist, you know, our job is to tap into those cross threads, mm -hmm. the interesting threads that actually form us into the human beings we are, all of those tipping points that we come up against that say, are you going to go bitter or are you going to expand? Are you going to concrete or are you going to go from flower to flower? And that is the interesting stuff. And as an artist, 
you know, we're telling artists right now that they're not allowed to do that, that they're not allowed to kind of focus on, 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 uh, you know, it's the stay in your lane brigade, you know, that you're not allowed to tell that story or you're not allowed to, to, to embody someone that you're not, you're not allowed to, uh, yeah, it's, it's getting into funny territory here, but, um, I just want freedom. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I resent having my freedom dictated by someone else who defines, who defines key words perhaps differently than I do. Like, what do you mean by discomfort? What do you mean by discontent? Like we, 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 we bumble about through this modern world without ever defining our terms. So there's a lot of uh, tyranny that happens in that space when we're talking at cross purposes and when, you know, words like hate or violence or oppression or, uh, uh, I mean, so many of those really important words that come to the shape of a story um, that will, according to who and what exactly do you mean when you say those words? Because only then can we start to develop an understanding with each other. And, and, and so all of this, I should find a, a point that I'm getting to, but it's, it's constraining the art uh, dramatically, tribalism, and that concrete is everywhere because it's incentivized. It's, there's actually quotas kind of pushing art to fall in line. And uh, that makes me cranky. And it makes me sad. And uh, so as that butterfly, I have to be careful. I have to be, uh, but I also have to just keep my head down and just keep going from flower to flower, keep doing my work and trying to not get so distracted by context, by culture, that I'm not personally sitting my butt down right here in this chair and continuing to try. So, um, that was a really roundabout ramble. I don't even know if it answered your original question. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Mm. So one of the things that pops into my mind is I've, I've been in process oriented therapy for a year and a half. What is that? It is the coolest way of The, the way that I perceive it is that it is therapy that takes all of me into consideration. Be it my words, my energy, my, my posture, the movements I make with my body, the nervous itching or the all of a sudden my feet are going mm. weird. You know, what's that? What? wants to come out so it's a way of letting all of me speak um and one of the things that has been been like grief has been a really really huge part of of it for the past year but also also the the insight that i have you know taught behavior, pattern behavior of, of not really expressing the shadow side, you know, oh, it's, yeah. you shouldn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. That's not okay. And I've been, I've been reading uh, Sarah J. Mass. She's a fantasy uh, author American. I'm right now reading the sixth book in her series, Throne of Glass. And it is awesome. It's witches oh, and magic is. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really, really oh, I'm going to have to get that from you later. Oh, it's so good. But one yeah. of the characters, and I talked about this with Andy, I think, or someone. It doesn't matter. But um, one of the character is a witch, and the first time you meet her, Man on Blackbeak, she is killing off human men who are 
chasing after and she's ripping them apart with her iron teeth and her iron claws. You know, it's like, oh my God, this is a horrible person. And somewhere there, you sense that she's brought into this book and she's just one of the characters who are rounded in a sense because they don't hide their shadow side. And that's one of the things that I, when I listen to you, that's one of the things that I pick up on. It's like, that's what I hear. That's the message I've heard that, you know, don't mention the war type of thing. We don't say yeah. that. We don't go there. We don't speak about that. Let's be over here where it's just nice and fluffy uh, and yeah. light and pink and, you know, soft and and, and never lovely. going, Never going deep. Never going yeah. deep, never going into the muck. Never being skeptical, yeah. Right, it's yeah. like the gore of it, the sweat of it, the shit of it. Yeah. You know, what about that stuff? And she does yeah. this, this man in black big is, is like, she's all of that. That's what she is. Oh. And I realized that, in a sense, I'm reading these books with these rounded characters. Kind of taking them on as proxy for me mm. for not for not being that for not show for not opening the door to my shadows and say come out and play won't you uh, yeah you know it's like okay no that door is shut locked key thrown yeah. away right because that that would be chaos that would be personal anarchy and that would be causing pain to everyone you know you know and yeah that's yeah. the feeling that i have because i've been saying this for the past few weeks it's like i think i'm gonna start to be not so nice you know because because those shadows with, with yeah the world it's like those shadows aren't they aren't serving me nor the world by me keeping them hid or locked away. I know. Yeah. They are coming out. And they don't need to come out as, you know, Sauron on the world. You know, it's like, it's <laughs> yeah. not that. Yeah. But I need to, they need to be part of everyday me to a degree yeah. that they haven't. Not that, you know, I'm not saying I've always been the light of of every occasion because i sure haven't you know yeah. i've brought some wrath into the world before too but but there's there's some shift in me that mm, some of that niceness is gonna have to leave because yeah anger because upset because no needs to take pl take a yeah. space, take a place, take up part of me mm -hmm. in ways that it, that, you know, scared the living bejesus out of me. <laughs> yeah. When I think about it, it's like, oh, shit, how do I do that? And, and mm -hmm. you know, and not drop dead um, from or the be fear. Distracted. Yeah, right. Or be, yeah. yeah, precisely be destructive in such a way because I don't. But it's like, it is the realness of that, the wholeness of that, that needs to be manifested differently than what it has been in my life for the past 50 years. I'm turning 50 this year, so. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that to me... I did, I remember writing about that in the book about fire. And I feel like that is the, that is really kind of breaking down our growth as individuals when we are interested in it, when we take it on. Really, that boils down to how do I keep my fire, respect my fire, tend to my fire while not scorching the earth? Yes. Like, because we need that element. We need heat because heat generates energy. You know, friction generates fire and, and, and heat, difficulty, suffering, pain, uh, injustice. Um, 
that all generates heat and flame and fire that 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 can righteously burn things up that can be that righteous no enough no more and that is our backbone you know that is kind of a, a, a profoundly fundamental part of what it is to to not be a doormat right. uh, to not just be one of those people who's constantly uh practicing obedient adherence to whatever the current thing tells us we have to adhere to and whether that's a cultural thing or whether that's sort of uh practicing that kind of adherence in our own personal lives so you can't be that way so so that's the whole trick is finding out that balance point of how do i have enough fire and and be fiery in a way that sets boundaries be fiery in a way that 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 nurtures my skepticism and that allows that voice to come through and that is brave and courageous and that will meet risk head on all of those things that we need to grow and expand is all thanks to that fire but when wielded in a way that's perhaps not self-reflective in a way that is uh um, not, uh, I don't, uh, the word responsible isn't right, but in a way that it's, uh, that comes from a wounded place, uh, then that can be just destructive and that can singe people we love and that, um, you know, we, nobody wants to get burned and nobody wants to lose control of who or what they're burning, you know, because it's, you think of a grass fire, you think of a wildfire and the way it spreads indiscriminately. Um, and once our fire gets away from us, uh, we're not getting it back and it is going to damage, uh, indiscriminately. So, so I think that is the whole journey and, and, uh, is, is how do we figure out how to keep that fire, respect it and, have an affection for it. You know, I actually write about it in the book um, and I call it our dragon, that when we have grief, all of a sudden this dragon has inhabited our bodies and it's in there and we can hear it growling and snarling. We can, we can see it kind of blowing smoke. We can see its eyes going red. Uh, we're seeing red through its eyes where we can feel that rage because there is a rage to grief that feels abnormal and frightening and scary. Like, am I ever going to be me again? Just me. Am I ever going to mm. be able to laugh at a joke again and, and not be constantly feeling like I'm pretending? Um, because we're turning away from that dragon. We're saying, no, I don't want this in me. No, I don't mm. want anyone else to see that I have this thing in me. It's uncomfortable. It feels awful. Get out of me. And that's kind of how we approach grief. But I think of it as that this dragon is, is, is in us now. And so how can we take care of it? And it's taking care of the ugliest part of us. It's taking part, taking care of the most potentially destructive part of us. And how can we do that in a way that respects the power of that dragon? And that maybe takes on that dragon as a heat that is actually protective and that we can bring to bear on situations or uh, moments in our life when we need that heat we need a little rah, rah, like we can actually it, it can become a fortitude and if we can find that point of balance then we can always feel that dragon in us but maybe he's just kind of curled up peacefully and sleeping most of the time you know, if we can only just tend to him and respect him and say, look, I don't, I, I know you don't want to be in me either. You were just out and about, and now you're stuck in me. And it's kind of this, this, uh, non-consensual bonding that we have with, with our dragon and, uh, it's not going away. And I think it isn't good for our health, uh, emotionally and physically to try to pretend that that dragon isn't there precisely and or it, or to not forgive ourselves for that dragon being there so 
So that to me is the whole, uh, that's the through line of personal development is yeah. how do I make sure I have the right amount of fire, the right type of fire and the right restraint on my fire. Uh, because restraint is, is dignity, elegance, and forbearance. Restraint is, um, you know, I'm, I'm, this is, this is getting to be a bit of an aside, but I'm, I'm writing a novel right now. That's, um, in, in, in some degrees, uh, a love story as well. And the sexiest pieces of it are the pieces in which the people are sort of the man and the woman are back and forth in practicing restraint mm -hmm. in pushing and in pushing back and then in pushing and in pushing back. So restraint is a really sexy, mm -hmm. beautiful thing. And there's such a cool energy in restraint. And so if we can make it our friend in regards to that fire, in regards to that dragon, there's such a power in that to be friendly with our heat and to dispense it when needed and to allow ourselves to be prickly in some ways. Um, like good for you, you know, yeah. that is something to strive for and mm -hmm. something to constantly practice is, is how do I, how do I develop an affinity for what initially felt like a heat that I will never learn to live with, you know? Um, yeah. So that's, and it, and it, it really right, reminds me, I'm, I have now started my second book circle uh, and my third reread of Women Who Run With the Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Yeah. I read okay. it. I read, I started to read it like in 2020. So two years ago, more or less. Um, and I read it through and then I've had a book circle on it. And then now I'm, I'm, I'm two times in on the second book circle where we do a chapter at a time. And it's just amazing. Cool. She speaks about in chapter one, the howl, the resurrection of the wild woman. She speaks about the life death life cycle, which yeah. for me is very linked to just this because fire is one of the things that can kill. Fire is one of the things that can have things die off. And mm -hmm. we need to have things die off now and again because life is factored on death, which then brings new life, which then of course. factors on death. The phoenix know. and the ashes. Precisely. It is. And, yeah. and, and it's like everything is, you know, we live, we can sustain ourselves because of death, because there's, oh, you know, worms that take the leaps that have died and turns it you know it's like everything is is based on this yeah so the 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 aspect of wielding the fire the aspect of dancing with it mm. you know it is a dance partner yeah. in life i am to dance with it now and again you know it's on the other side of the room and I'm over here. We're just kind of, hello over there. I see you, right? And now and again, man, we are close and we are dancing our asses off together. Yeah. Which then has much more of that heat. Uh, the power of destruction is there. It is present. And then it will fade away. You know, we'll... Yeah. Go on all the opposite sides of the room again. And it's like, okay, I don't need to know more than that you're there, over there. I can yeah. get you when and if the context requires it. Of course. Uh, rather than what yeah. I perceive that I have, you know, I've shut it down. I've, I've turned it away. I've turned it not off, but I've locked it up so far mm -hmm. down that I don't ever really get to dance with it. So I don't get the benefit of the death that that That's heat right. brings. Yeah. It's like, yeah. mm, no, I need more life, death, life. You know, that cycle is, is, yeah. is, is the foundation of life. It's the life, death, life cycle. Without the death part, life would not be. 
Yeah, and you you think about how bleak people can be when they are devoted to being cold. When they are so, you know, you think about what fire is. Fire is destructive. Fire reduces us to ashes. Fire is that kind of end point. But at the same time, when we are wandering in the woods, when we're cold, fire saves our life. So we see that glow. And when we're in the dark and we see the glow of a fire, we think, oh, thank God. Like there's life. Like I am still alive and I can still be alive because of this fire. And I really think there are people who are so uh, afraid that they will not be able to contain fire or that fire will singe them. Uh, that they stay so far away from it that they're cold. And I think cold is where, you know, rigidity kind yeah. of yeah. sets, is is in that coldness. But, you know, places that are deeply cold are, are, are the bleakest. Fans of Antarctica and penguins might disagree with me. That's probably not the right way of putting it, but... Um, you know, it's when you think of cold and, and, and just, again, following that analogy of everything being frozen, of, of reaching a point of paralysis, of really that point where you're so cold and you're shivering so much and you're, that, that your, your movement starts to constrict and you start to, um, all you can think about is just is, is the fire and how much you need it. And so I can't imagine the, the battle for people who are so... Um, determined to not address and integrate fire into themselves, whether it's suffering or pain or, uh, you know, accountability for oneself and one's position and, and one's history. Um, really, fire is that discomfort. That, that is how I would describe it, that it is a death force it is a life force yes. all all in the same and that heat is for me that is the heat of discomfort of constant or sorry discontent that constant sort of twitch that is that positive fire that's saying now come on come on like you can do more than this like you can be more than this you can create that thing yeah it's uh we're sort of really chasing this analogy all the way down the street aren't we? <laughs> we are and i just love it um, yeah it's so fun it's so fun but maybe that's a good place to wrap yeah i, I think we only did clock, we only but... did like three proper rants um we can definitely make it to 10 by the time our uh our, our five our, is our, over yeah our five is up yeah <laughs> 10 rants later <laughs> yes exactly uh, yeah and i keep forgetting too that when i look in here that you can yeah. see this lovely lady in the background yeah, yeah i was gonna and ask I, you yeah it's given that we were talking so much about lineage and history she I, I don't know who she is or who she was other than that she was french and um although she looks she looks more sort of slavic or or german to me but uh she was in an antique store and we wanted the frame and, and my husband is an artist and he, he was going to get rid of this, uh, because he was doing something else with the frame. And I thought, oh, I love her. I loved her sort of slightly disapproving, yeah. um, discomfort. She's watching you. She's a little bit disapproving, but she's also got the tiniest bit of a smirk mm -hmm. going on at the same time. And, and, um, and and I, I love I love her. So I, I have her there and I'm always forgetting I wish she's like right over my shoulder. People are like probably distracted by looking and thinking, My goodness, what a stern looking what a stern forest that I need her over my shoulder when I'm here uh working working uh, to address my discontent. So yeah. she's she's perfect. <laughs> you know, again, she nourishes you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and her, she would not have been easily blown over. And I think I, I have so much 
uh, appreciation for that. Yeah. Lovely. Well, yeah. And I'm excited for the, for, for continuing to chat. This is just, uh, very fluid and very cool. It was fun. It, it is fun, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah.